Okay, we're going to do the last chapter of Hebrews. Hebrews chapter 13. We made it through this book. I probably have 13 hours of study on this one book on my playlist on the channel. So you can watch them all in a row. I'm sitting here at the Pacific Ocean on the Oregon coast. We got a, a minor storm today. The rains are back. And when the rain comes back, 50% of the tourists left the Oregon coast this week. And they're headed towards um, Arizona for the winter. 50% of the homeless people left immediately. They're heading towards California. 50% of the people in sprinter vans, you know, broken down motorhomes, whatever, old vans, they left this week. And they're heading towards Southern California and then over to Arizona. So I pretty much just have the whole place to myself. <laughs> Hebrews chapter 13, it's not as long as the other chapter, so it shouldn't be that super long of a Bible study. Keep on loving one another as brothers and sisters. Have you learned yet as a Christian that love will solve every problem you have? God's love? I'll explain it briefly. God's love, I will tell you my 61 years experience here. God's love will solve every problem you currently have. Loving your wife or your husband. You're going to use the world's standards to love your spouse, or you're going to use God's standards to love your spouse. Loving your children. Especially if you have teenage children, you're going to scream and yell at them using the worldly standards of love. What the, lo what the world calls love. Or you're going to love your children with God's standard of love. Now, how can this change your life? Do you love your job? J-O-B, do you love your job? Now, I'm going to teach you something so profound, you can't even comprehend it, I'll bet you. I hope you understand some of it. See, I love making these Bible studies. I'm sure some of you are saying, how can he make a Bible study like that every day? Well, I love to do it. And look at where I'm at. I'm out in the middle of, you know, the Oregon coast. I love being here and doing this. Do you love your job? You probably do not love your job because you're using the world's standards of enjoyment towards your job. Now, and if you do, if you're one that says, oh, I love my job, you're probably still using the worldly standards to decide whether or not you love your job. And you probably actually don't love your job. You probably love it because it's convenient for you you get a lot of bonuses, a lot of treats. You probably work at one of those places that celebrates every holiday in the office. Like every week at your job is another party full of foods and junk food. You know, that's not love. If you use that standard towards your spouse, you're going to be divorced. I'm going to love you as long as you always bring me flowers and candy. I'll tell you a quick story here. I used to sell flowers on the street corner in Colorado Springs, Colorado. On the holidays. We did it Thanksgiving, two days. Three days, Valentine's Day. So Valentine's Day. And I worked for a guy who... um. 
He had like 50 corners because he was the original one that did it. Nobody else could do it. He owned a flower shop, and he had 50 corners in Colorado Springs that he put people on selling roses on Valentine's Day. And in three days, I'd make over $200. I'd get um, some all the free flowers I wanted to take home. I'm standing out there. Now, Valentine's Day in Colorado is the same as everywhere else, February 14th. And I bring that up because February 14th in Colorado Springs, in my experience, is always 10 degrees outside. I would know because I did it. I was the guy. It was a temporary job that you could go down and pick up 200 extra dollars in three days and get like $50 in free flowers to take your wife at the end of your shift. So I'm sitting out there. All the flowers are frozen, right? Completely frozen. Every flower is frozen. Now, the guy liked me because I had an old um, 78 station wagon. I tried to keep the flowers inside. This was when gas was, you know, $1.50 a gallon. And I tried to keep the flowers in the back of my station wagon. But, of course, I was out there like 10 hours a day for two and a half days. You could not keep your car running for 10 hours a day. Okay, so love. We're talking about love. A man walks up to me. Now, back then, I was like 35 years old. This 45-year-old guy walks up to me. He looks at the frozen flowers, right? It's February 14th. And it was either a Friday or a Saturday night, which makes it worse on the guy. The guy walks up to me and says... Is this all you got? Now, this guy was very handsome. Nice. This was um, 25 to 30 years ago, and the man was in a forty to $50,000 construction truck. He was very successful and had lots of money. 35 years ago, he was bringing home $1,500 a week at his job. He comes up to me. He says, is this all you got? I said, yeah, it's real late at night. I said, he goes, do you know any place in this town I can bring, go get some flowers? He said, money is no option. I said, I am the only one in town left with flowers. People have been telling me they've been to every store in town and they're out. The guy started crying right in front of me, crying, weeping. It was so cold, the um, tears on his face were actually freezing. I said, hey, man, what's wrong? He said, oh, I got problems at the house. He goes, I've been living with my um, girlfriend for three years. She told me, if I don't bring home flowers tonight, and they better look good. She's leaving me tomorrow. I said, wow, that's a pretty um, hard standard to live by. Aren't you in construction? He said, yeah, you see my truck. I said, how many hours a week do you work? He said, about 80 hours a week. This was during a big, huge housing building boom. He said, about 80 hours a week. I said, is she always like this to you? Yeah, she's a mean woman. I said, so why why are you still with her? Well, I'm a traditional guy, and I thought I'd marry her. And I said, you're going to marry a woman who treats you. She can't see you're working 80 hours a week. What does she do? He says, she sits at home and does nothing and spends my money. I said, you, you got yourself into a trap. I said, I'm a Christian. Do you mind me giving you some advice? He said, I'm a Christian. He said he was a Christian. He wanted the advice. Now, remember, we're talking about this story because 
God's love versus the world's love. I said, I'm only going to ask you one question. Is this, is this girl, is this living situation, you being yelled and screamed at when you come home after 70 to 80 hours work, is this what God wants for you? Without hesitation, he says, no, it's not. He said, in fact, this girl has taken me away from God. I used to be close to Jesus, he said, and she's dragged me away the last three years. I said, yeah, so what are you going to do? He said, what do you think I should do? I said, well, I'm married to a fantastic woman, doesn't care if I bring flowers home or not. I said, if you're living with a person you're completely miserable with, and you're not married to them, and you're paying all the bills, I said, I would go home, I would give her $5,000 to move out and never come back. She'll probably take it. If she won't move out, then I would move somewhere. He said, yeah, we're just renting a house. I said, then I would move somewhere else. And I wouldn't pay the rent there anymore. Because she's loving you according to the worldly standards and that always fails. She's not loving. I said, is she a Christian? He said, no, I'm a Christian. She's not a Christian. I said, it sounds like she's using you as a checkbook. And the reason she yells and screams at you is because she's trying to control you because she's actually afraid that you're going to leave one day and she'll have to go out and get a job. So sometimes when people are trying to control other people, they yell and scream a lot. The guy shook my hand and said, I think God told me to come over here and talk to you. He says, I'm going to go home and move out of that house next week. He said, then I'm going to go back to church and get close to Jesus again. Keep on loving one another as brothers and sisters. God's love, I said, God's love will change the rest of your life. The world's love will give you only a shadow of God's love and eventually destroy your life. You see, the world's love is from the devil, Satan. The world's love is like the Garden of Eden. The world gives you a false sense of what love is, like the forbidden fruit in the Garden of Eden. Love. You can have gay sex, lesbian sex. You can have um, gay man sex. You can have sodomy. You can have sex with animals. You can live together and never get married. You can live with someone and their kids aren't even your kids. You're raising another man's children. These children aren't biologically yours. Maybe you love them. Maybe you only love them to the worldly standards. We send our children to school and the school claims that they love our children so much. You ask the average teacher, we love your children so much, but it's not, it's a worldly faulty love. And then we send our children to school in today's society and the teachers love your children so much. Now, hang on. They're trying to talk your children into getting sex changes by age six years old or younger. That is what the world offers as true love. And if you're a believer for very long, you know the difference. Now, I will solve someone's problem out there, many people's problem. Listen to this. You're trying to get the world to love you. You're trying to get all the people around you to love you. And it's causing this friction. Now, I'm going to tell you right now, hang on, how to solve this problem. 
once as a Christian, this is the most important thing you're ever going to hear your entire life. The top information coming straight down from heaven. So listen, once you as a believing Christian understand what God's love truly is, and then you, you've talked to God and Jesus and the Holy Spirit about it numerous times, and as a Christian, believing Christian for Christ, once you are fully convinced that God loves you, he will always love you, he will never leave you, and you don't need any other love except God's love, right? Your whole life changes in the blink of an eye, and you do not require people to love you after that. And I, I use the word require. You no longer require them to love you. If they love you, it's a bonus. But their love, compared to God's perfect love, their love is always going to be faulty and a little off in the world. I myself cannot love my wife 110%, and she can't love me 110%. Even though I am a very lovable person. <laughs> but I'm telling you. No, I'm not always lovable, believe me. It's impossible because I'm in the flesh. The flesh cannot love the same as the spirit loves. And then once you get into the world's love... Pornography, a lot of people call pornography love. Or people say, I love to go out on my boat and just sit there. So I'm going to spend $80,000. You ask a guy who owns an $80,000 truck, what's your favorite thing about your truck? If he really tells you the truth, he'll say, well, I like to drive my truck out in the woods and sit in it alone so I can think. So the world told him, well, you need it. The devil said, you need an $80,000 truck so you can go think. No, what you need is a $3,000 Chrysler. Go sit next to the lake, throw your um, $10 Zepco fishing rod in and think. Just sit and think. But I'm telling you, once... Most people buy a house because they are searching for love. Oh, yeah. And again, you seem shocked that your boss at work does not love you. you. You seem like you're surprised. My boss doesn't love me. I need my boss to love me. No, what you need your boss to do is pay you for a job well done. You got to do the job well done, and then he pays you, and you go home. But, but if you walk into your job with knowing that God loves you, Oh, it changes everything. I'm telling you, you can walk into your job tomorrow and they'll say, you're fired. And you will say, knowing God loves me, he must have a better job for me. And you will say very calmly, you will be the very calm one in the corner going, oh, I'm fired. Okay, well, I guess I got to take a five months vacation on unemployment. Go fishing for five months. And then God will give me a much better job after I've had like three, four months off on vacation. And you walk up to your boss and you say, well, shake his hand. It was nice talking to you. I mean, working with you. Take care of yourself. If, any, if you hear of any great jobs, let me know. That's the problem. Two months later, your phone will ring 10 times, people wanting to hire a guy like you. Because God lo God's love gives you peace, confidence, hope, trust, durability, discipline. Now let's read it again here. Keep on loving one another as brothers and sisters. Okay. Okay. 
It does not say, it does not say, keep on loving one another as the world loves itself. Keep on loving one another as brothers and sisters. Well, what are your brothers and sisters? They're not talking about biological brothers and sisters. They're talking about believers as fellow Christian brothers and sisters in Christ Jesus. Okay, so now you have to find out who Christ Jesus is, Jesus Christ, in order to find out what love is. And then you can love your brothers and sisters and everyone else on the earth, and then you can even love your enemies. You know how Jesus says, love your enemies. I tell you, love your enemies. And most people are like, how do you do that? They're my enemies. Because it's easy for Jesus to love his enemies because his love is perfect. And he knows that his enemies are going to be crushed and sent to hell if they do not turn from their evil, wicked ways. If they do not turn from their ways and start believing in Jesus Christ. So Jesus has a whole different view of everything. Okay, how do you get a man named Jesus Christ to freely walk up to the cross and be nailed to it and die on behalf of my sins and your sins as believers? Love, L-O-V-E, God's love. For, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. Whoever believes in him shall be saved and have eternal life. For God so loved the world. If you want to change your entire life, go ask God about love every day for the next 30 days. And once you are fully convinced that no matter where you go on this earth, God is with you and loving you and helping you and preparing you and teaching you. Everything else is fine. If you see someone in public freaking out, you're not freaking out. You're full of God's love. If you see someone that wants to fight you, you're not going to fight. You're going to say, hey, man, God loves us. Let's just try to get along. You're always going to, it doesn't make you weak. It makes you stronger. God's love. I could talk 10 hours about it. But once you finally figure out, and that's why Paul was able to endure the prison, because God love, God's love was with him. And here's the greatest thing about God's love. It's free, 100% free, no charge. Wow. We have a God who created the heavens and the earth that gives us all these things for free. Once you figure out that the only thing you need, now listen, and then I'll get off this and go forward. Once you realize that the only thing you need on planet Earth is God's love, you're untouchable. Oh, they might persecute you. They might chase after you. But they can only do what God allows them to through his love. They can only do to you what God's going to allow them to do. And you're going to confidently live in God, this inside this love of God pouring down on you. And God's love becomes like a daily waterfall. Do you know I woke up this morning and God spoke to me? That happens every day, seven days a week for me. But I'm saying sometimes he speaks to me before I start praying. Like, as soon as I get out of bed, Jesus told me something. And I went, oh, yeah. And it improved my life before I even drank one ounce of coffee. It improved my life immediately. I said, thank you, Lord. Right, that makes sense. Boom, click, bam. My life changed immediately forever because that one piece of information I'm telling you 
Now, I'm not going to tell you what it was. It's personal between me and Jesus and my wife. I tell her everything. Keep on loving one another as brothers and sisters. Do not forget to show hospitality to strangers. For by so doing, some people have shown hospitality to angels without knowing it. Have you ever entertained angels and you didn't even know it? Continue to remember those in prison as if you were together with them in prison. You see how every single one of these things he's telling you to do um, spring out of God's love? And you see how, how you say, how am I going to do all those things? Through God's love. With God's love, you can do all things now. How did Jesus heal all those people? I'm not saying you or I can heal people. I'm saying how did Jesus heal all those people? It started with the love of God, the love of the Father. Continue to remember those in prison as if you were together with them in prison. And those who are mistreated as if you yourselves were suffering. Marriage should be honored by all. I just went over that. And the marriage bed kept pure. That means you are not allowed to commit adultery. And you're not allowed to bring pornography into the bedroom. And you're not allowed to treat your wife like some kind of a rag doll. And you're not allowed to um, make your wife do all different kinds of freaky sexual things because you think God approves it through marriage. No, it says here, keep the marriage bed pure. Not pure with the world standards of pure. What is God's standards for the word pure? P-U-R-E. For God will judge the adulterer and all the sexually immoral. You know, you can be sexually immoral just married to one person and having relations with just that one person. You can still do sexually immoral things in your bedroom as a married person that God does not like. Now, I'm not getting into your sex life. That's not what I'm doing. And if you're a woman and you go and you've been doing this for 20 years in your marriage and now you, you're going to go home and explain to your husband, we're not going to do those fun things anymore. Uh, your husband might leave you. Marriage takes two people agreeing that things should change. You have to explain to your husband about the purity of God. And he has to get it across his brain first. You can't just go home and demand your spouse immediately change because Jesus spoke to you. No. Keep your lives free from the love of money and be content with what you have because God has said, now let me back up. Keep your lives free from the love of money. From the love of money. Okay, why did they talk about love? Why do we go through all those things about God's love and then they immediately bring up money again? This happens every time in the Bible. They're talking about love, love, God, 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 and then money. Can you not see money is the false God of our generation? You see, if you really believe God loves you, you wouldn't buy 75% of the junk you buy and bring home and put in your garage and never touch again. If you truly, truly believe God fully loves you, your mind would not desire other things. You wouldn't even go to the store, the big box store to look around. You'd have a ton of money in your savings account. You'd be content with a bowl of vegetable soup and some biscuits. God's love, once you have it, your money life immediately changes instantly. Your money life will instantly change once you have God's love in your heart. When your wife or your husband makes a mistake and yells at you, and you're full of God's love now, 
you will just smile, hold their hand and say, it's okay, I love you, we'll be fine. Oh, open your eyes, my friends. Don't you see the power that God's love is trying to put into your life? 80% of all the problems in your marriage will go away if you both start understanding what God's love is. How do you do it? You, you look at all the verses about God's love in the Bible, and then you can Google them, and then you have to believe. You have to believe what it says. God has said, never will I leave you, never will I forsake you. Okay, I just said that. If you know that God is always with you, he will never leave you, never forsake you. You're not set for life. You're set for eternity. You're not going to have a great life. You're going to have a great eternity. God says, I will never leave you. You were one of the ones that believed upon my son, Jesus Christ, on the cross. So I have forgiven all your sins. Your name is written in the book of life. You and I will be together for all eternity. Once you get this, God's love, in your life, you, you'll you stop drinking, you'll stop smoking pot, you'll stop um, doing drugs. You'll understand, I don't need anything else. I don't need to look at pornography. I have God's love. There's nothing more valuable, I'll tell you that. And we say with confidence, the Lord is my helper, Oh, that's so beautiful. I will not be afraid. What can mere mortals do to me? <laughs> that just clarifies everything I just said in this chapter. What can the world do to me? What can mere mortals do to me if God is helping me? Who is stronger than the Lord's hand? Have you ever thought about living a life where, you know... Too many desires equal poverty. That's out of the book of Ecclesiastes. But have you ever thought what your life would be like and how free you would be if you went to work, you came home to a simple three-room house, you never bought anything hardly ever, and that's the way your wife and kids wanted it also, and 50% of your um, paychecks go into a savings account every week. And you don't have to go out to movies or to the mall, buy stuff. You might go walking as a family. You can grow a garden as a family. You can sit at home and play board games as a family, clean, clean cut ones. You can play, um, you know, word games. You can, um, you can buy some bicycles and go exercising around your town. You know what happens when they see a, a husband, a mother, and two little kids on four bicycles going down the street? Everybody who sees you says, oh my gosh, that's the way things used to be. That's the way things are supposed to be. I'm going to go home and buy my own family some bicycles. You become the example for everyone else. Do you know, have you ever thought to yourself how free you would be if um, things did not own you? you all your credit cards were 100% um, paid. You kept your two best credit cards in case you ever had to fly or travel. You cut all the other credit cards up in the confidence of God's love and just sent them in, said, close this account. I'll never need it again as long as I live. Can you imagine cooking your family healthy meals seven days a week? Can you imagine the kids at your school going, to your children, your mom takes time to make your lunch and send it to you. And the kid's like, yeah, I got a big, nice, huge chicken salad sandwich today. They're like, oh man, your mom is so awesome. How do you find the time to do that? Because you won't be doing any of the other things in life because you only do most of the things you do in life. Now hang on. It's because you're looking to be loved. You know, why is that? You were designed by God to seek out love. God's love. 
Do you know God would walk in the Garden of Eden in the cool of the day and talk with Adam and Eve, and it was just pure love. And then the devil came along. God said to the serpent, what is this you have done? He broke the bond. The serpent broke the bond of man and God's love. And he offered a shadow, an imitation of God's love, the world. Do you ever wonder how we went from the Garden of Eden to like um, skyscrapers in New York City? And I look at those skyscrapers and I think how how all those people are sitting in there and they're so lonely. They're so lonely and depressed. And the worst thing, and I'm laughing, the worst thing is while they're sitting in the skyscraper cubicle offices, lonely and depressed, they have to also work and perform things to make other men rich. <laughs> It's not enough that you're lonely and you're depressed and you're feeling unloved. But now someone comes along and says, well, while you're having all these horrible feelings about your life, I need you to work. I need you to get to work and start. Per <laughs> I know it's, it sounds weird that I'm laughing. And I need you to start producing a product. You're like, but I feel lonely, depressed and. Well, that's why we're paying you $12 an hour. Now get back to work. I like it when a company gives you death benefits. Like you get like a $10,000 payout if you die and you go, you know, to the personnel office and say, "Well, how do I get this benefit?" Well, you have to die. Well, what good is that benefit to me? Well, it's not good for you, but it would be good for your family. They don't have to pay for the funeral. I don't see that as a benefit. If you have to die to get the benefit. So you see, you're searching for an imitation of God's love in every aspect of your life. Remember your leaders, or what can mere mortals do to me? I'm showing, I'm telling you how to break the bond of this world because the Lord showed me how to do it a long time ago. Remember your leaders who spoke the word of God to you. Consider the outcome of their way of life and imitate their faith. He's talking about Christian leaders. You know, the disciples, Paul... Jesus. Jesus Christ is the same yesterday and today and forever. How many times have you told Jesus, wait here, I'm going to go buy a house. Wait here, I'm going to go buy a car. Wait here, I'm going to go buy a new dress. And Jesus, you don't understand, he's looking down on you and saying, oh, you think you believe. He's saying to you as child, you believe that that's going to fulfill your heart. The only thing that's going to fulfill you is if you follow me and I fill it for you. It's another great thing about God's love. I cannot get it myself. I can only receive it for free. I can only receive God's love for free. Do not be carried away by all kinds of strange teachings. That's 2023. Look at how many strange teachings we all endured for three years during the pandemic that all the governments of the wor entire world told us all these things that weren't even true. It is good for our hearts to be strengthened by grace. Notice it didn't say by the world or by shopping or by purchasing new things for my house? By grace, not by eating ceremonial foods, which is of no benefit to those who do so. It just pretty much said the world is really of no benefit to you. 
Only God and Jesus and the Holy Spirit are benefiting you for all eternity and in the world now. But the world, the ceremonial foods, all these things, they're of no benefit to you. You just haven't understood that yet. We have an altar from which those who minister at the tabernacle have no right to eat. The high priest carries the blood of animals into the most holy place as a sin offering, but the bodies are burned outside the camp, the bodies of the animals. And so Jesus also suffered outside the city gate to make the people holy through his own blood. Let us then go to him outside the camp Bearing the disgrace he bore. You know, it's saying there, separate yourself from the world. Go outside the camp. One thing that it means, one thing. Separate yourself from the things of this world and go to the blood of Jesus Christ and you will receive everything you've ever desired. Starting with God's love, mercy, hope, understanding, his friendship, How did God, how did Jesus solve our problems? He gave us his love. Why didn't Jesus just buy us all a house and heal us all and say, you can all live to be a thousand years old. You can all have foods that's very healthy. You know, he had the power to do all those things too. And why didn't he just all give us all $10 million and then just solve our problems like the world is trying to solve your problems? The world is telling you, as soon as you get a million dollars, all your problems will go away. And that is why there is many, many American capitalism-driven rich people today sitting in million-dollar houses, and they are some of the most miserable, lonely, unloved people on the planet. Because they never took time to find God and his son, Jesus Christ. They don't know what love is. I saw some guys the other day. It was funny. They looked down on me. Because I'm sitting in my, you know, $1,500 automobile here. They pulled up in a $95,000 Cadillac SUV Escalade, top of the line. All the bells and options. And six of them get out in their golf uniforms. They were all golfing at a nearby, you know, golf course. And they might have even been like semi-pro, like not professional, but semi-pro. And they were all about 45 to 55 years old. And they all just had money and dripping out. And it was funny because... They spent more golfing that day and then the motel and then all the expensive foods and, you know, all the expensive SUV, the cars. So they spent more that one day than I do in 30 days in a month. And they kind of looked over at me and kind of laughed. And looked away like, I mean, I could just feel their thoughts saying, and, and I'm laughing. You guys know I'm laughing. You know this makes me happy. It doesn't make me sad in any way. They looked at me, and I could feel their thoughts going, look at that bum. <laughs> look at that old hippie beach bum just sitting there. You know, the funny thing is, they were going into the grocery store to buy some chicken. And I was going into the same exact grocery store buying the exact same chicken. They were had they had this big, huge, expensive lifestyle. And I was eating the exact same meal they were. Except I was doing it and giving thanks and praise to God Almighty. And they were giving thanks and praise to alcohol and the golf course. Seriously. 
The six of them probably spent $2,000 that one day. And they probably had a corporation. One of them had a company that paid for it all and wrote it off on their taxes. And they said, now this is living. And they all sat around some $240 a night motel room smoking big $10 cigars going, now this is living, boys. And then they looked down at the beach. <laughs> now I'm just making a funny joke, but they looked down at the beach and they see a guy named Dave that looks like a beach bum. And they're like, thank God we're not like that beach bum down there. Don't judge a book by its cover, my friends. And God wants them to be saved. God, want, through love, wants them to come out of their horrible lifestyle, and it's horrible because they're separated away from God. Let us go outside the camp. One way to say that is let us go outside, away from the things of the world, to Jesus. Let us go to the foot of the cross and find out exactly what God wants. There's not much left. For here, we do not have an enduring city, but we are looking for the city that is to come. Well, I just made my point again. We don't have an enduring city on earth that's going to last forever. There's no earthly city that's going to last. We are looking for a heavenly city, bringing heaven down to earth. One day, we're not going to be in our body. You're going to be in a perfect spiritual body living in a perfect city with a perfect holy Jesus Christ for all perfect eternity, my friend. That's what Christianity is offering you. Some people say, oh, New York is the best city on the planet. Nope, L.A. is the best city. Nope, San Francisco is the best one. No. The Oregon coast has better cities. You see, that's what I'm saying. We're all looking to make utopia in this world, perfection in this world. We're all looking for technology to make, help us live for 10,000 years before we die. Well, what happens if we achieve that and you live for 1,500 years, but then you die? You'll still die. You still have to stand in front of Jesus Christ and give an account for all the times you told Jesus to go shove it and jump in a lake. Jesus said, if you are ashamed of me and my name, I will be on earth. I will be ashamed of you and your name in heaven in front of my father. Through Jesus, therefore, okay, everything's about Jesus. Through Jesus, therefore, let us continually offer to God a sacrifice of praise. You know, you don't have to sacrifice animals every year now. There is no such thing for the Gentile. He wants a sacrifice of praise. God can only be worshipped through truth and spirit. You can praise God by speaking truth, living truthfully, and living in the spirit of God with God's love, pouring down upon you like a gentle waterfall. Through Jesus, therefore, let us continually offer to God a sacrifice of praise. The fruit of lips that openly profess his name. For those who openly profess the name of Jesus, God loves that person. He doesn't matter if you're black or white. Doesn't matter if you're Korean or Oriental. Doesn't matter if you're Mexican, African. It doesn't matter if you're Canadian, European. It doesn't matter. God loves those who follow his son, Jesus Christ. Doesn't matter if you're rich or poor, young or old or middle-aged whether you're healthy or you're sick, God loves those who profess Jesus Christ like it is the fruit on their lips. Do you ever think, you know, the Bible says, as a Christian, produce fruit? The words you speak are the quickest way to produce godly fruits. 
or it's the quickest way to, um, you know, follow the world and curse the things of God, destroying yourself. The fruit of the lips that openly profess his name. And do not forget to do good and to share with others. For with such sacrifices, God is pleased. You're supposed to share openly, but I will add, do not throw your pearls to swine. I wouldn't give all your pearls to non-believers, that's for sure. If you see a believing brother or sister who is struggling, I would put my money as an investment into a believer. If a non-believer needs help, the most you can do is buy them a bowl of soup and then ask them to go to your church and become saved. Other than that, there's nothing you can do to help them. You can pray for them, but they have to make a decision. Am I going to be a believer or a non-believer? So far, they have decided to be a non-believer. I just saw um, some people run by me here jogging. It's like 48 degrees out. They're freezing their butts off. They're jogging. They're not out of shape. They're already in fantastic shape. So why are they jogging? They're looking for something. When you already look like a million dollars, like you're one of those blessed people, like, you know, don't hate me because I'm beautiful. You know, you already look like a supermodel. You already have the world by the tail. Everything you want in this world's being given to you. Well, then why do you go to the gym and jog? What are you looking for? That person is looking for love and they're not finding it. I've noticed, I, I have known many, because I worked in restaurants, and I've hired some of the best-looking waitresses on planet Earth. Not because they were good-looking, but because they filled out the application, and they were the only one that showed up. So I said, you're hired. You're the only one that showed up. But the fact that they were incredibly gorgeous, they made so many tips because of their looks and most of them were miserable and unloved. They they had, you know, they might make six, seven hundred dollars a week waiting tables 40 hours a week. But they don't have love. They're lonely. They're they don't have God's love in their heart. It doesn't matter what you look like. I've seen some of the weirdest looking old men, and not because they're old, they're just like short, kind of maybe their faces wasn't the most handsome in their life. And these are the nicest men that just spent 60 years in God's love, and they are nice and kind and pleasant to be around and uplifting and encouraging. I know a Christian man, I worked with him for three years, side by side. I was actually his boss. He was a full-time um, third grade school teacher. When he was born, they said he'll never, um, he won't live and he'll, if he lives, he'll never speak or walk normal. But his family was Christians. This guy grew up to be a pillar in his um, small city. Every parent. This guy taught school for 30 years straight. He went to community college to become a teacher and went straight into teaching for 30 years. He had 30 years of students that he saw everywhere he went in that town. And he was the kind of teacher when you became an adult, because he was only five foot two or five foot three, people would come up and hug him Oh, this was my third grade teacher. This was back in Iowa. The guy died at age 60 of like cancer or whatever. And he was a Christian and he immediately went into the presence of Jesus Christ. This guy worked as a full-time teacher. Then he worked at a restaurant 
part-time. And during the summer, he worked at the restaurant full-time. And then he painted houses in the summer also. And he saved all that money and put his two daughters through college debt-free and made sure they got married and had grandchildren before he passed away. He wasn't supposed to make it past the first week of his life. So people say, well, God, why would God take that man at age 60? Well, he didn't. The world was going to let him die at age one month. And then God stepped in and gave this man out of love 60 years. And this man, he was highly adored. And he told his students, if everybody in the class gets above a C, I mean, above a B or an A grade on the test. Now, this is third grade, so these kids love it. He will um, jump on his desk and, and dance to some oldies uh, music in front of his students. That's how he would treat them. He never once sent a kid to the principal's office. He said, I've never met a bad kid that I couldn't talk to. This guy was perfect in the job God gave him. He went to church every week. He was a deacon in the church. They put him in charge of walking around with the basket and collecting money. This man was supposed to die and be a nobody. And I worked with him side by side for three years. And I can tell you, we were both Christians. We had so much fun working. I mean, we were working so hard. We'd do like three or 400 dinners in one day during the summer. And it didn't even phase us. We were having so much fun. Have confidence in your leaders and submit to their authority because they keep watch over you as those who must give an account. And I will say that man is with Jesus today. And I will say another thing. We were working with another teacher there that was closer to my age. And he was a wild guy. And boy, he women were attracted to him. And, and we prayed for him. And we were best friends with him, too. Oh, we had some good times. And this guy, because of me, Jesus, and the teacher guy, we were all three in Christ, see? A cord of three strands. And we prayed for this other guy in front of the other guy. And you know, 10 years later, he met a Christian woman, became a Christian, he moved to a large city, I won't say where, and he became the top, he wasn't a principal, he was the director of the entire school system in this town of like 300,000 people. He was the director of the entire school system, and he did it for um, 25 years as a Christian. And that all came about because we all prayed together inside that little restaurant, coffee shop. Do this so that their work will be a joy and not a burden, for that would be of no benefit to you or anyone else. Pray for us. We're almost done. We are sure that we have a clear conscience and desire to live honorably in every way. I particularly urge you to pray so that I may be restored to you soon. Paul is saying not restored in sin wise. He's saying physically restored so he can visit you. Visit those people. Now may the God of peace who through the blood of the eternal covenant brought back from the dead our Lord Jesus. 
Jesus Christ died on the cross just as if you were to die. And God brought him back to life. Jesus says, I have power to um, take my life and or give up my life and take it again. Come back to life. God the Father brought his son back to life. I bet the devil was standing there going, oh, finally, the Son of God is dead, finally. And then Jesus comes right back to life, and the devil's saying, no, 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 what? No, God said you have to die. He probably started calling God a liar and stuff. God brought his son back to life so that you and I may have eternal life. See, we started this chapter out. Your entire life will get 90% better once you start understanding God's love surrounding you and never leaving you. All the things of this world will no longer be appealing to you. They will not have... For example... So, you know, I've gone to movies like in the 1980s and the 1990s, and sometimes I'll see those movies on YouTube, and I'll say, oh, I remember this movie used to be so great. And I look at it for five minutes, and I realize it's not the movie, it's me. I'm like, that's the dumbest movie I've ever seen in my life. <laughs> I can't watch over five minutes of it because God has changed me. The movie's exactly the same, but I'm not the same. Now, I'm going to tell you a story about, I heard it on a um, radio preacher. I have nothing to do with this story. It's just a man. So this was like back in the 1800s, like in England or whatever. There was a certain man who used to visit a prostitute. You know, he'd get drunk. And he'd go down to the prostitute every weekend. Give her the money, go in, you know, have sex with her. But then something happened. The guy went to church and gave his life to Jesus Christ. The guy gave his life to Jesus Christ. And so the prostitute thought the guy, the man had died because she had not seen him in several months. And one night the man had to be walking back to his house past that old neighborhood at night. And the prostitute says, you know, like, uh, George, George, don't you recognize me? It's me. And he kept walking. She says, George, George, aren't you going to come talk to me? It's me. And the man turned around and said politely, yes, but it is no longer me. It's not the old George you knew. It's no longer me. I'm a new George with Christ. I'm a new person. I cannot visit you ever again in Jesus Christ. Once you understand God's love gets a hold of you, Everything in this world, like you want to go camping, right? Well, I'm going to need a $99,000 truck camper. But guess what? With Jesus, you only need a $9,000 truck camper. The world says you need a $375,000 house, but with Jesus, you only need a $120,000 house at the most. You see, you realize this. The world says you need to buy the $89 pair of jeans, but with Jesus, you only need the Walmart $19 pair of jeans. Because you no longer are looking for love in a mirror or how your jeans look hanging off your body. In Jesus, you no longer need makeup and jewelry. You don't need a money clip. You don't need $3,000 in your front pocket like a lot of rich guys. In Jesus Christ, you no longer are the same person. That's what the man with the prostitute, he said, but it is no longer I. It is no longer the old me.
Now may the God of peace, who through the blood of the eternal covenant brought back from the dead our Lord Jesus, that great shepherd of the sheep, equip you, he's saying, may this God equip you, strengthen you with everything good for doing his will. Not your will, but you won't want to do your will. That's the whole point of this chapter. You will, once you get a hold of God's love, you will no longer desire to do your will. You will only desire God's will because there's nothing anymore on this earth that gives you pleasure. You won't need to go buy a $6,000 couch. You'll be happy with the $800 couch. Your whole entire life, you won't see a couch as a thing of love and beauty and grace. You'll see a couch as something your kids are going to sit on and rip to shreds anyway. The things of this world, when God comes in, will no longer have a hold of you. And that, my friend, is my brothers and sisters in Christ. That is when your freedom arrives. May he work in us what is pleasing to him through Jesus Christ. I told you in previous chapters... How do you get anything you want from God quickly? By asking God for the things that God already wants to give you. May he work in us what is pleasing to him. So if it's pleasing that God gives you something, pray for that. Say, Lord, give me what you want me to have. Dear Lord, on your knees, give me what you want me to have and I will be satisfied. And the Lord says, will say, that is good to hear because I do have some things I want to specifically give you for following me and, and running away from the world. And then you'll receive them quickly because he already wants to give them to you. Why would you spend your time praying that God gives you something he never wants you to have anyway? You're going to beat your head against the wall for 30 years or until you give up. You're going to beat your head against the wall thinking, if I don't get these things in the world, I won't be successful and my neighbors will think I'm an idiot and my wife won't love me and on and on and on. It's not God's fault that your parents raised you wrong to serve capitalism. And your school teachers raised you wrong. And maybe your pastor raised you wrong. That's not God's fault. That's the world's broken system. People are always going to be continually failing in this broken system of the world. What you need, like the super glue to the broken lamp, you need the super glue of God's love will come and repair everything. And then you'll realize, hey, wait a minute. I don't need to fix that lamp. I don't even need a lamp. Why am I spending a large portion of my work life buying lamps and stupid things like this? To whom be glory forever and ever. Amen. God. Brothers and sisters, I urge you to bear with my word of extortion. For in fact, I have written to you quite briefly. I want you to know that our brother Timothy has been released. So he must have been in prison, Timothy, for a while. If he arrives soon, I will come with him to see you. They didn't have cell phones back then. They didn't have a telegraph. They didn't even have the post office to mail a letter. They might give a letter to someone, and then the person gets killed on the way delivering the letter, you know, 300 miles away. They might write a letter, and it takes six months to get there. 
Greet all your leaders and all the Lord's people. Those from Italy send you their greetings. Grace be with you all. We have finished the book of Hebrews. What was the lesson there? There's two kinds of love available to you right now. The world's love, which will continually keep you broken down. If you had a car that got a flat tire every single day, how many days would you go before you changed the rim on that tire and said, oh, it's not the tires. I keep buying new tires. It's the rim is broken. And the rim is broken. How many days? I guarantee it'd be the third day you're driving to work on Wednesday and you get a flat. You'd be like, what the heck? I just replaced it. You'd go down, you take that rim, you throw it in the garbage and buy a new rim and a new tire and then the problem would be solved. You see, that's the thing about Jesus Christ. He's not giving you... Jesus Christ is not trying to repair your broken life. Jesus Christ is not going to come along and say, let me fix that broken rim for you. No, Jesus Christ is, in a sense, throwing your old life away and giving you new life. 100% new life. New life. He's wanting to give you a completely new life. And the second thing we learned is God's love. Once you get it, you begin to not desire anything else. And, and I'll tell you, crazy things happen. It's happened to me. You say, I'm not working until I'm 65 for the world. Oh, I can live easily on one income. I'm going to get my Social Security at 62. Oh, I'm going to save my money. I'm not going to spend money. I'm going to start teaching my um, children and my wife about Jesus Christ and the Bible five days a week. We're not going to watch TV. We're going to have a Bible study and enjoy it. Maybe get out some popcorn. Don't drink sugar sodas. It's not good for you. Get out some popcorn and some uh, non-sugar something. I'm telling you. Once you find God's love, you're hooked. The, the, the world no longer seems good to you. I will end with this. Have you ever been, you ever thought you were in love with someone? Like as a young person. You ever thought that you were madly in love with them? And then you see them five or six years later? Like maybe you thought in junior high you were madly in love with some girl. You know, but then you see that girl married at age 24 or whatever, and you say, wow, I am so glad that I did not end up with her. And she might be thinking the same thing about you. What I'm saying is with God or separate from God, the things of this world seem appealing and that's just to keep you flat broke all the time. But with God, the things of this world no longer have that appeal. They are not appealing at all. They have no appeal whatsoever. God's love is the only thing that's going to fix you.